So greetings all. I recognize that you are halfway through the morning. Your energy levels may be getting a little bit low. It's the last day. You may have been out late. But my job is to both bring up the energy level and engage in a practical conversation about what we can do in terms of AI, using it ethically, and avoiding some of the pitfalls for your organization. But before I get too far involved, can I get this side of the room to shout out the word change, please? Change. Oh, that was very quiet. Can I get it one more time? Change? change. All right, and this side, can you shout out the word agents, please? Agents. Oh, you are quieter than them. Can you do it even louder? Agents? agents. All right, can you do louder than them? Change? change. Agents. And together, can we shout out change agents? Change agents. All right, I appreciate that because oftentimes we're looking for someone else to be the source of figuring out all these solutions. I appreciate the very humbling introduction that Elliot gave me, but I want to put forward that all of us in the room have the opportunity to be positive change agents in the field of AI. We are the Calvary. Nobody else is going to be coming. And if we don't step forward to try and figure this out, don't be surprised if our future is less optimistic and less hopeful than we want it to be. Now, again, there's been several conversations throughout the days here at the conference. I don't need to go too much into this other than to make the point that we are seeing unprecedented technological change. I would submit to you that 2013 was a year that we humans made history and we barely even noticed it. There were the same number of network devices on the face of the planet as there were human beings. 7.1 billion human beings, 7.1 billion network devices. Any guesses as to how many network devices were on the planet just two years later in 2015? 14 billion relative to 7.3 billion human beings. And so if you play that out over the next seven years, 2025, we are going to see about 8 billion human beings if current trends continue and upwards of 75 billion network devices on the planet. In terms of data, we're going to see 96 billion terabytes, that's 96 zettabytes of data, which is more data than all human eyes see on the planet at the moment. It's also twice all the conversations we've ever had as a species. Think about that. There's going to be more data on the planet than we've ever had in terms of conversations as a species times two. We are going to be drowning in data. This, of course, raises very interesting questions because how many of us go past the third or fourth pages of search results? If you don't, you may be missing out on things that are either great opportunities or things to avoid. If you don't go past the third or fourth pages of search results, you may be missing on things to seize on for your opportunities for organization. And that raises the fact that keyword search will probably no longer work four to five years from now. We're going to have to think about how the data finds us, which of course gets to questions of intelligent assistance, machine learning, and actually helping people have the data come to you. But that raises another set of questions, which is, are you willing to give up what you're doing and have that be shared with the machine in return for the machine saying, would this be helpful? I see you're working on the following task at work. Would this data be relevant? And would those people who choose not to do that be at a disadvantage in the new world ahead? This gets to the question again, if we don't start having the conversations as a community, don't be surprised if those less informed start having the conversations without us. We've got to figure out how to begin to address these issues. So making the case that we're going to see more change in the next 20 than we saw in the last 20 years, and think about that for a moment. Play back to 1998 and think about everything that's happened since then. 9-11, the anthrax events, what's happened in terms of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, global change, the backlash to globalization, all that being compressed into seven years as opposed to two decades. Do we not think that's going to strain the private sector? That's going to strain the public sector. That's going to strain how we work together as communities. Again, that's why we have to be willing to step forward. Now, I'd like to real quick have two volunteers. I think I'm going to call on Elliot as one. So Elliot, if you could come up real quick right here. Can I have one quick volunteer as well? Anyone else want to step forward real quick? Yes, OK, if you don't mind just coming up real quick. 
All right, so we're going to play a little game in which imagine I have $100 in my hand. And if I could get your name, please, sir. Lawrence. Lawrence, thank you for stepping forward. I appreciate Lawrence. you helping. Lars, thank you, Lars. I appreciate it. So, Lars, imagine I'm going to give you $100, conditional upon you making a percentage offer to Elliot and him accepting it. One shot deal. Percentage offer to him for the $100. $100. So, how much of the $100 do you want to offer him? If he accepts it, he gets that percentage and you get to keep the rest. 75%. You offer him 75%. Elliot, do you All accept? Right. I'll take that. Wow, that's great. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to flip it slightly, but I'm going to say now, Elliot, I'm going to give you a million dollars, but you've got to make a percentage offer to Lars. How much do you offer? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> are we talking about ethics here? Uh, I'm just making an uh, offer. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll offer 50%. 50%. Do you accept, Lars? No, all right, so neither of you get anything. How much would you have accepted? At what point would he have offered it? 60%. If he had offered you 60%, you would have accepted it. Yes. All right, well, thank you very much for this hypothetical exercise. I truly appreciate it. Can I have the check now? Uh, I will get to you right after the talk. <laughs> thank you. So that was a little case example, but how many people know what economics would have said would have been the rational amount for either Lars or Elliot to have offered? What would economics have said? One dollar. Offering one dollar in any situation because having one dollar is better than having nothing at all. And it's irrational to turn down any offer. The fact that they were very, very generous is probably because I got them on stage and they meant to make sure they didn't look like they were too selfish to you all. Had we done it behind the scenes, more often than not when you play this game with people, it's generally about 20 or 30 percent they offer and people accept. Below 20 percent people reject. But this is not unique to humans. Monkeys generally don't like cucumbers. They'll eat them, but they prefer bananas. But if you're feeding monkeys cucumbers, they will continue to eat the cucumbers up until the point they see another monkey getting a banana. And guess what happens? They stop eating the cucumbers, they throw them at the researchers, and they reject eating. That's not rational because that's starving and it's going without food. But somewhere along the line, our series of primate species on this planet developed an irrational sense of fairness, and those who did display that behavior were more likely to pass their genes on than those who did not. So what does that mean? It means we humans are irrational. If we see other people getting things that seem out of proportion with what we're getting, we will begin to reject even the things that we are getting. Even that one dollar, if we see someone else is getting something more, we reject it. And guess what the internet does? It connects us to societies. Guess what the challenge is? It connects us to societies. We now see what looks to be unfair around the planet. And that's why I raised the point that AI, in addition to what's already going on the internet, will impact us at work and how we govern and as a society because we humans are irrational. And if we do things that are predicted rationally or if we teach the machine to be treating us rationally, we may reject the machine. That's why you already begin to see some concerns about the future of work, the future of autonomy, and questions about will it be fair? Will the displacement that we know is coming be equitable? And how quick will be the recovery from that displacement that will occur? Which raises massive questions for all of us. Now, again, I'm not going to get too much into the future of work. That could be easily a conversation for another day, but I will at least make the point whether it's going to be more jobs or less jobs at the end of the displacement that happens, this coming digital revolution is different than ones in the past because now you can make a profit without involving any humans in the loop. That is different than the ones in the past. And so as much people that say, well, yes, the horse carriage drivers got displaced, but then they got replaced with cars and car drivers and people that are manufacturing cars, yes, that was physical labor. But this is different because we're now moving to the point where you can do an investment, produce an outcome in terms of either a machine learning approach, deep neural net, whatever it might be, and have no net human labor after that has been produced and make a profit. That's different. Second, and we've already been seeing this, and we felt it yesterday with the stock market, that those Western nations whose currencies are currently highly valued have effectively displaced them from competing in the global market. We are at the high tide for certain countries and the low tide for developed countries whose currencies are high. 
eventually globalization will reach us all up, but what the economists did not tell us is that takes time. And the question is whether or not people are willing to wait or whether we will continue to see this backlash to globalization. And then finally, as I already mentioned, we humans are irrational. You've already saw that little example of economic exchange, but then as well, when it comes to having a sense of purpose, those humans who have a sense of purpose have better individual health, better mental health, better community health. Their family is also better healthy as well. And if we take away that sense of purpose from humans, it's been shown their health erodes, their communities devolve. And so the question is, how do we redefine a sense of purpose in an age in which it's going to be first pairing humans with machines, and then eventually some of those jobs will be done by machines. Yes, maybe they may do something else, but if we take away the sense of inherent human purpose, we may find that it erodes certain communities. And I once had a conversation with a high-level individual last year in England who said if there's anything we learned from Brexit, it's that we did not talk enough to the rural areas. I realize today we're here in Boston, but how many of us are talking to the rural areas about what we're seeing with AI trends? How many of us are thinking about how it's going to impact them? Because they're still probably raising their hands and saying, wait, we haven't even caught up with this computer revolution, and now you're telling us this thing called autonomy and AI is coming? They're probably a little bit fatigued, and that raises questions for all of us. So this December 10th is 70 years since the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which happened after World War II and was put in place to prevent another world war and a series of atrocities that had been associated with World War II from ever happening again. Anybody know how many human rights there are? If not, there are 30. But that shows something, which is the question of whether or not we have done a good job of upkeeping and preserving basic human rights, or if we sort of have forgotten about them because we've not had another world war. And the question for this age of AI and autonomy, will it reinforce human rights, or will it take it away? I assume some people in this room know what Sesame Social Credit is. Raise your hand if you do. Wow, OK. Well, if you're not familiar with what Sesame Social Credit is, it rolled out about three years ago in a very large country in Asia. I'll let you guess which one. It is a voluntary system up until 2020 in which basically you, your online presence and your physical presence is given a daily credit score. You post good things about the party. You buy from certain companies. Your score goes up. You buy, post bad things about the companies, you buy from non-local companies, you buy from foreign companies, your score goes down. And it knows who you hang out with. If you hang out with people with higher credit scores, they themselves bring your score up. You hang out with people with lower credit scores, they bring your score down, and there are rewards. You get faster internet as your score gets higher, you get slower internet as your score goes down. You can't check into a certain hotel, your score goes too low. You can't take an airplane or a train if your score gets too low or apply for certain jobs. This will be mandatory in that country by 2020. So I raise that because while we are talking about AI trends and we are optimistic about the future, it may very well be that this also becomes a way of mass surveillance at scale that doesn't need humans in the loop. I won't talk about deep fakes. That's another conversation for another day as well. But we know that those are also on the horizon where you can now make it look like people said something or did something they never actually did. It's been shown in the research literature that it generally takes 10 to 25 years, almost a new generation, to figure out the ethicalness of any technology. Lest that sound hypothetical, the United Kingdom in World War I thought that submarines were unethical forms of warfare because they were underneath the water. They did not pursue submarines. We know how that played out in World War II. I raise that. And there's also, as we've already heard from the panelists, AI is already learning from our own human biases. It's nice to talk about whether or not we have biases in machines, but guess what? We humans have tons of bias. It's in our language. If you do sort of autocomplete on search terms, you'll find certain professions have he or she at the end of the profession. And that's simply because that's how the machine has looked at the data we currently have. It's not saying it's right, but the machine has looked at past history and may have reached spurious correlations that a profession is associated more with a male versus a female. We know there are certain faces that right now, if you try and present it to a machine algorithm visually, it may not be able to identify that face because it's from a minority group that has not been in the representative training sample for that data. Not going to dive too deep into this, 
But I think it's worth revisiting at least two of the classics. One is the categorical imperative, which we know is behave in a way that you're okay with it being a universal truth for others. Another way to put it, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Let's think about updating it as companies, as organizations for the modern era and say, do unto others as you think it's in their best interest and they've given informed consent. Whether that be for healthcare purposes with AI, whether that be some sort of assessment of their financial status with AI, but it raises the question, of course, what is informed consent? But it's at least a practical step we can take forward. How many people know who John Rawls was? Philosopher, 1950s, middle of the 20th century, he basically had this idea of a veil of ignorance, that the moment we're born, we begin to become biased as to what we think is fair, right, and just. And so we have to pretend we're not born yet and ask, what would we agree to? Everybody is biased by their situations, but what he asked is, how can you make sure you remove that bias from your experiences and at least say, what if I was somebody else? What would I find acceptable in this situation? And so you heard a little bit from the former panelists about thinking about how you do that function in organizations. I would ask if your organization doesn't already have a group that's playing that role and say, how will this look in the shoes of somebody else? You need to be doing that because it at least will help ground your ethical discussions in practicality. The professions. In the medieval ages, you pretty much lived and died in the same city. You probably didn't wander beyond about 10 miles from where you were born and where you eventually died. But starting in the Renaissance, you could now travel outside that city and it raised questions. How do you know if that doctor, how do you know if that academic, how do you know if that lawyer really has the training and the know-how to do their profession and is really actually doing things ethically? And so the professions arose in the Renaissance as a way of self-policing. They'd give you a certification after you proved you had the know-how. You actually also had to do sort of an experience-based approach. And they also had a code of ethics. Hippocratic oath for doctors, lawyers, they have the bar associations in different countries. And if that ever was a case where one of their individuals displayed unethical behavior, they would review it and kick them out if that was the case. But it was done as a self-policing function. And maybe we need the same thing for AI where we have a professional society of AI experts that one, take an oath to use it ethically, and then there's self-policing involved, because if we think that regulation is going to keep up with this changing space, we're probably wrong. That said, we know that we humans have confirmation bias. The moment we believe something's true, we start looking for information to reinforce that view and dismiss other information. There's also cognitive easing. If I repeat during this talk a certain phrase, the body temperature of a chicken, I don't even tell you what it is. I just repeat the phrase, the body temperature of a chicken. And at the end, I tell you, the average body temperature of a chicken is 36 degrees Celsius. How many of you think that's true? More than three-fourths of you will think it's true. It's not actually, it's 41. But by saying it so often, I have primed you to think it's true. Marketing does this, politicians do this. And so this raises also questions for the AI era, which is how do we overcome our own limits of human bias when we begin to use the machine. Going to close with this framework and five actions. First, think about your obligations to society. Spell them out in bullets. Keep them very short, not 30 or 40 pages of legalese. Just put them in bullets. And then possible biases or blind spots you might have. And then in response to that short list, what steps do you want to do in part of those obligations? And what safeguards do you want to put in place to address those biases? Do you want to actually have a way of involving the public or your customers or your stakeholders to at least inform you if they think something's going wrong or that AI effort you're doing is being used unethically? The words expertise and experiment both come from the word out of danger. The only way we get expertise is we do dangerous things, experiments. If we knew how they were going to work out, we wouldn't be experts. That's what we do when we try to move forward in this era. And the five things I want to charge you as conference attendees. First, develop a data ombud function. We already heard this from the group. Ensure that your data is representative and diverse, and any conclusions made from that data are ethical. Two, embrace continuously learning. If your organization is not adapting and experimenting, then you're not going to be able to figure out how to survive in this new era. Assess how the data and algorithms are being used in your organization, but also assess awareness of biases or opportunities to improve. 
consider a people-centered data contract. Right now we hoard data and I understand that it is seen as the new oil or the new fuel for the era, but involve people in the discussion. At least let them have visibility as to how their data is being used. Involve your customers and stakeholders early and often. Think about, again, the idea that if you involve them, it's not that they necessarily have to understand everything you're doing or see everything you're doing, but if there's a group from the outside plus your own in-house people, that diversity may actually point out some blind spots you never even knew and may actually make you more aware of how you're using the data ethically. And lastly, as I started this talk with, we are the Calvary. If no one else steps forward, no one else is going to come and address these issues. The people in this room have the deep expertise necessary to begin the shared conversation about how we address this. I'll end with one closing thought. In 1994, Carl Sagan said, look again at this dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. Honor everybody you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Be bold, be benevolent, be brave, and most importantly, be positive change agents for the new era. Thank you very much. <laughs>